a lunch you brought with you because uh, this is a bring your own lunch event. Uh, but we're going to go ahead and get started because we have 15 lightning talks. Um, so an hour's worth of uh, fun and research. So I'm Carol Palmer. I'm the Associate Dean for Research here at the iSchool. Uh, we are recording this event. So uh, uh, if for some reason you don't want to be recorded, you can say so and we can pause it for a minute. But we are going to try to capture what we do today. Um, I, I want to start with our land acknowledgement. The University of Washington acknowledges the Coast Salish peoples of this borough land on which we stand, land which touches the shared waters of all tribes and bands within the Duwamish, Suquamish, Tulalip, and Muckleshoot nations. We pay respect to the elders, past and present, as well as the living descendants and future generations of the Coast Salish. So this event, uh, we've been doing it for several years, but this is, the last two years have been online, so it's really wonderful to have everyone here and be able to do this together um, as a school, as a community. This is a collaboration that's put together um, uh, with uh, help from both research services and student services. So it's a very important intersection of our faculty and our students. Um, and it's also, you know, we're here to share research with students, but it's also really a wonderful way for us to see a little bit more about what each other are doing. Because as you will see, there's a lot going on, uh, and it's a very diverse set of activities across a lot of different disciplines and research areas. And I really like to think of this as a kind of celebration of our research. So I hope all of you will get into the spirit of that. And there's chairs up here if anyone wants to come and sit down uh, up front. Okay, I'm going to turn it over to our dean who is going to offer some welcoming remarks. Thanks, Carol. I'm so glad all of you could join us today. We got the light. Um, this is a really important event for the school and for our students. So let me tell you a little bit about why I think research is critical. Um, you're going to get a you're going to get a uh, set of talks from faculty in the school and research scientists in the school. But if you think about, if most, of you, most of you students think about uh, what is it that a professor does most of the time, most of you think that what we do is we show up in front of our classroom, we teach our students, we go back, we continue working on lessons, plans, and grade. What happens, in fact, is that most of our faculty on the tenure track side, for sure, most of our faculty are extremely heavily engaged in research. The University of Washington is what's considered an R1 university. It's a, it's a top-ranked university for research. So a, a, a requirement of our faculty, and clearly for our research scientists, are to engage in cutting-edge, world transformational research. And um, we're all really lucky to get to hear 15 of our research scientists and faculty talk today about, about the research. Um, the next question you should, you should be asking yourself is, well, you're already here, so that's already a good sign, but why should you get engaged in research? And there's lots of reasons for this. Um, one, it's a great way to get to know our faculty better. It's a great way to uh, learn about a topic you've never been, you've never investigated before. It's a great way to make a contribution in an area that you're really excited about, even if you're not sure how you can make that contribution. Um, and I would say that uh, for some small, for some percentage of you, you're going to want to continue on in a career in research. I think very few of the people in the room who have received their PhD you know, went into college, went into a master's degree saying, I want to get a PhD. I certainly did not. And uh, getting engaged with research and, get, and, and getting a little taste of what that's like and sort of the, the freedom to explore from an intellectual perspective is really exciting. And the last thing I'll say is that the skills you learn in do conducting research are going to carry through and impact a lot of the things you would do outside of research. So I'm glad you're here. I hope you enjoy these presentations today. And really reach out to the faculty where, where the, you know, there's a spark of interest. If you have, if there's, you have an interest in one of the projects that our faculty or research scientists are pres pres presenting today, please reach out and contact them. We, you know, we, we love to have students work on our projects. So that, that's bad. OK. Yes, let's give, let's give our dean a round of applause. This is a great, great support of our research, and um, it is so important to what we do. I did um, just put this slide together to give you a sense of the very, you know, sort of the range and diversity of the areas that, um, what we like to say, are, are areas of research excellence. So as you can see, 
Um, there's quite a few of them, and uh, but the thread that holds them all together is information, right? We call that the red thread of what passes through everything that we do. So hopefully you see yourself and your interests in, in somewhere in that group. And you can go to the web pages, the research web pages, and look further and see all the people and projects associated with each of these areas. And I also just wanted to point you to, there's another web page that's good to, um, uh, for tracking the research activity. Not all of our research is funded by um, external sponsors and grants, but a lot of it is. And this is a great way to see uh, what's happening now, right? What's, what's recently funded and what might have new opportunities for students to get engaged. So if you go to the grants and awards page under research, you can follow um, the, the newly emerging projects as they're funded. And this is just the first top four that are up there. And you know, each year we report our you know, awards number, which fluctuates from 3 million to 12 million. Sometimes we've been up to 16 million. But this is a pretty good um, number that's sort of in the middle of what, what we sort of invest in every year in research. OK, so here's our format. Um, this is mostly for the presenters to remind them of how we're going to work through things today. We have about an hour of lightning talks. Um, we have actually 16 presentations now. Um, and now they're a little less than four minutes each. Um, but so remember, four minutes max. Now, we'll see how this goes, because I told all of our presenters that they should, I recommended one to three slides. Um, and you'll see, we got a lot more slides than that, which is great and fine. <laughs> um, but I guess I'm really going to ask that you, you know, hold to the minutes. Uh, I'd like you to, in, you know, leave time for questions on your project if you can. But then we will take time at the end, um, any time that's left over, for just open questions for the whole group. Make sense? Any questions? Are you ready? It's going to go. It's going to be kind of you know, head spinning, I think. Um, it's a lot of projects, but uh, pace yourself. And we're going to start with Lucy Lu Wong. Excited to kick this off. Uh, hopefully, I'll stay under time. So, my name is Lucy Lu Wong. I'm one of the uh, new assistant professors joining the school. So, excited to be here. And today, I'm just going to talk about a bit of my uh, research direction on AI assisted systematic literature review. Um, and uh, Wait, wait, wait. Tell me the next slide. Okay, okay. We'll see. So, what are systematic literature reviews? They are a type of article that synthesizes uh, results from all available studies, and they provide high-quality evidence for clinical care. So, they're a very important type of um, document. However, they're extremely expensive to produce. And here's just some steps in producing a literature review. First, you have to formulate a research question, then identify relevant studies, assess study quality, extract and summarize results, and then finally interpret the findings. But in this middle space here, there's a lot of potential for uh, automated methods to help. And um, I'm, I primarily work on kind of NLP and machine learning models for understanding scientific texts, but also to kind of build usable and actionable systems powered by these uh, models. So why do we want to do this? Uh, again, there's um, a, this is a really expensive process. It can take a team of researchers some of the several months to several years to complete the next things. Um, so uh, by uh, providing some AI assistance, we can reduce reviewer frustration, uh, provide more up-to-date evidence. So sometimes, uh, if it takes two years to make a review, it tends to be out of date by the time it's published. And then, of course, um, this last point, which is providing an easier way of translating research findings into practice. Thanks. Um, so uh, next. Uh, what are some examples? Um, of, uh, of work in, in this space. So for example, towards identifying relevant studies, um, I work on systems for a dedicated search for underserved topics. Uh, for example, um, a project I was involved with uh, studies um, uh, how to discover supplement and drug uh, interaction. So dietary supplements are underregulated and their safety information can be kind of hard to find. Um, so for, for a project like this, we constructed a knowledge base of supplement drug interactions, um, made them searchable via this very intuitive interface. And, uh, and actually the system, this, this research prototype is live and supports quite a number of users, um, uh, about 25 to 30,000 per month. Uh, and I think there's a lot of potential to develop search in this kind of space um, that's, that's somewhat underserved. 
Uh, and then towards assessing study quality, uh, something I'm interested in is clinical trial risk bias assessment. Um, and uh, for this, you know, we found that prior work has found that 85% of studies contain methodological flaws uh, that impact the quality and trustworthiness, whereas the tool for assessing this kind of thing is essentially like a PDF document that has to be uh, completed for every single uh, trial. So it's just not uh, very easy to use. I think there's lots of things <coughs> for, for NLP and ML to help here. And actually, I'm going to skip for the next example and just go directly to um, my uh, final slide uh, on research opportunities. Uh, certainly looking for anyone who's interested in doing independent study. Um, also, some possibilities for RA ships uh, on a variety of topics, extracting, disambiguating claims, generating multi-document summaries, um, AI-assisted clinical trial risk and bias assessment, as I just mentioned, uh, and also looking for people with a variety of skills. If you're interested in quantitative skills like NLP machine learning, um, front-end development, uh, but also kind of uh, other skills such as conducting user studies, doing uh, data annotation and design, Based construction, all of these uh, are really super useful. And I'm pushing the factory, so uh, uh, if anyone has questions, feel free to reach out and contact me. Thank you, Lucy. Look at that. She's got a one second left. Let's see. Mm -hmm. Okay, over to Ott. Um, yes. Is everyone here? Is the mic working all right? Uh, I hear yeah. It's a little bit soft. Yeah. So, all right, I am Ott Domet. I am mostly teaching uh, data science here at various levels, from this level to this level. <laughs> and if you can push a button, please. So, uh, in terms of research, I have been, the um, last few years, involved in, um, let's call it, uh, how to extract data from uh, documents. And the problem is that um, computers and humans tend to read very different things. If, as a human, I would very much prefer to have something printed on paper and signed by hand, instead of going into database and adding di digital signature to some sort of SQL queries and stuff like that. Uh, so we have a tons and tons of these kind of documents as some sort of PDFs or essentially photocopies in computers. And here is an example. It's about, um, about eviction records, so a court document that stipulates that these two people are going to get out where they are living. And our task is to find, uh, to find um, some sort of general information about these documents. For instance, what are the names here, who are these people, when did it happen, at which address did it happen, and so on and so on forth. Okay, if you push that. <clears throat> So what we are going to do is we are using machine learning uh, techniques, and here is an example of, well, what is machine learning? It is finding pattern in data. Here is an example of a very simple pattern. It's a temperature, global temperature through years, and I guess everyone can spot this pattern, including computers, including humans. Uh, here is a much more complicated pattern. Uh, this is address, it is a Tony's address. Um, and we have marked that, for instance, we have house number, and we have street name, and street type, and direction, and city, and so on and so forth. So we are using these kind of patterns to, um, to uh, train certain kind of much more flexible models than the ones that was able to uh, figure out the slightly linear trends. And if you look here. So, um, uh, and previously what students have contributed here, on uh, related projects, or this project, is uh, cleaning various kinds of errors, uh, developing and training the algorithm and training data, reading papers, that's terribly, terribly important thing. And also uh, doing various kinds of analysis and web scra scraping and these kind of things. All right, I think I'll stop here. If anyone else wants to say minutes, something. if you want to take a question. Exactly, if anyone has a say, then please. <laughs> Okay, question. Okay. Nothing else to say. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Emma Spiro. I am an associate professor here at the iSchool, also one of the co founders of the Center for an Informed Public. 
Uh, so I'm here to tell you a little bit about some of our work on misinformation, disinformation, and other kinds of problematic content online. So um, we like to frame a lot of our work in terms of the study of rumors. We think about rumors as something that's unverified at the time that it's being talked about. Um, much of our work sort of stems from over a decade of trying to understand rumors and unverified information during crisis events. So that could be a natural disaster, it could be social political unrest or protests, um, and it could be elections. Um, side, please, Carol. Uh, so we've learned a lot, I think, in our studies, and we sort of formalized a lot of these efforts at the CIP over the past couple of years. Um, just a few things that I wanted to kind of um, uh, put out there to think about. So, you know, we use a lot of language around mis and disinformation. Uh, we think this language is really important to be precise because the words that we use carry assumptions about how information is spread, who spreads it, and why, um, and what the solutions we might have for these kind of problems. Um, so we like at the CIP to think about everything from how information spreads, why information spreads, um, and then possible solutions to it. And I hope uh, Jevin, who's going to talk a little bit later, will sort of dive into that, that piece a little bit. Um, we're all vulnerable to misinformation, and right? we've all sort of shared things or engaged with things online that turn out later not to be as uh, valid. Um, so this is a problem that affects all of us in this room, um, and we have to participate in a lot of these phenomena for them to work. Right? So for things to spread online, people have to share them, people have to engage with them. And some of the really problematic stuff we see sort of opens up that door for people in a way that feels like they have a stake in it. Um, so what I wanted to uh, mention in terms of some of our ongoing projects, like this, Carol, is actually what we're working on right now at this minute. Um, Jeff and I are, uh, just ran over from our space in the CIP, um, and we're right now working on uh, the Election Integrity Partnership. So this is a, a partnership between the Center for an Informed Public and other uh, partners, including Stanford University, folks in sort of local government, um, and uh, social media platforms. We have a huge team on board that is trying to, right now, in real time, monitor um, information that's happening about the midterm elections, um, think about responding in real time to some of this content to help um, sort of secure our elections and think about what we can do to protect the electoral process and procedures that are going on. So, you know, we document the spread of rumors, we think about um, trying to have efforts to debunk or pre-bunk some of what's going on. So we have a huge team and we always love to get new students involved. Carol. So a couple things I wanted to mention in particular, um, I'm going to be teaching a directed research group here at the iSchool, uh, DRG, which is scheduled to be in the winter and spring, uh, that's, you know, in a few short weeks away. Um, and we love to get students involved in research projects to come, sort of think about the data we're producing during these midterm elections, think about some of the data that we captured in 2020, um, and all sorts of different things. And we need all sorts of different skills. Okay, so folks who are on the data science side of things and want to do more um, uh, quantitative kind of projects, folks who have more sort of interview or qualitative skills and actually want to go in and code data or think about interpretations of what's going on. Um, I also teach a class on problematic information, which is scheduled in the spring, and then we have lots of opportunities for not only four-credit things, but paid research opportunities um, for PhD students and also undergrads as well. Um, and please get involved in our CFP community events as well. Last slide has some contact info, and there you go. Thanks, Emma. Uh, Test. Okay. Can you hear me back there? Yeah. Yeah. All right. So I, I am. Uh, my name is. Okay. I can see that. Uh, I'm Chris Carrot. I'm a senior principal research scientist here. I'm also a member of the Center for Foreign Public that uh, Emma just talked about, and I'm also going to talk about um, one of our projects, which is a more on the solution side of the center, as Emma mentioned which is a misinformation escape room. So, by a show of hands, how many people have done an escape room? Look at that. Okay, so most of you already have an idea where this is going. So, we had this kind of fundamental question. How can you build information or misinformation literacy, if you will, 
right? When we see that a lot of the problem is informed by the, or where we see from the psychological sciences that, and in fact, facts really don't make a lot of difference in our decision making, right? We like to think that, oh, we can just teach people to tell truth from fiction, but that's not always the case. And there are many reasons for this um, that the psychological sciences contribute. For one, emotion works, particularly negative emotions like fear and anxiety. They can be triggering for you to believe in something. Secondly, cognitive biases. As I mentioned, we are all vulnerable. We all suffer from confirmation bias or other types of biases that are just built into us as humans. There's also the social nature of information and who we trust and who are our networks. And self-identity, like who we perceive ourselves to be you know, in the world. So all of these things have a big influence on why and what we believe. So, at its root then, the problem is not a skills deficit, or it's not only a skills deficit. I'm not going to say that skills don't matter. Um, but if we think about our educational interventions, for the most part, we say, oh, these are the ways that you can search better, or these are the ways that you can validate information. While important, we don't think it's sufficient. So games have a lot of features and make them attractive as an educational medium. They're interactive and immersive. There's, there are environments where it's okay to fail. Uh, in fact, it's, you know, it's part of the game. It also provides an on-ramp to be able to talk about difficult issues, particularly when the game's kind of fictional and you can kind of relate it to kind of real-life situations. And of course, games are fun. They can have wide appeal. So we have several projects. The first one, the Origin Investigation, was our first escape room. It's available now, both online and, and uh, in person. And libraries around the country, and even around the world, are starting to use it. Um, and we've been doing lots of studies to understand how effective is it. If someone takes the escape room or participates in it, what type of effects does it have? We have also have a, a couple of design projects. Um, how many people here are armies? of an army? Oh, not so many. I thought we'd have at least a few hands. Who knows BTS? Okay, a lot of hands there. Well, ARMY is the name of the fandom group uh, behind BTS and uh, Professor Jim Ha Lee's involvement with that group. And we co-designed another escape room with members of ARMY fandom um, for interspaced escape rooms. We have also are having a partnership now with the Fred Hutch Cancer Center. Um, which is seeing an increasing amount of problems with people believing, uh, like cancer, uh, nutrition misinformation in particular. We're trying to understand what are the emotional triggers that lend themselves to people believing that information and what kind of gamified approaches can we develop for them. And lastly, we're working with kids to see how they think about misinformation and develop game-based uh, solutions for them with Jason Bitt. Thank you. Good job, Chris. Yeah, and if you haven't done it with the escape room, you definitely have to do the escape room. So I'm going to talk about a question that bangs around in my head a lot. I know it bangs around in Hannah's head and Chris's head and everyone else that works at CIP. But I know it's a question that we're all dealing with. And certainly, if you're going to work on a project like this, you want to be at an high school at the University of Washington. Um, and one of the reasons why this really matters is that it affects our health. It affects our politics. It affects everything that we do, and this was a real statement by the U.S. Surgeon General in July of 2021 when uh, they, his office came out and said, we can't just look at public health, uh, can't look at the health issues of public health, we have to look at the information. And that's a lot what we do in, in the information school. And so we have the Center for Informed Public that we collaborate with the law school, next slide, um, and HCI and, and other, uh, uh, HCDE and various other places across campus. And I already talked about this, but this is Oh, this is a hub for doing this kind of work. And so we've already seen some of the work. Emma mentioned some of the things. Chris mentioned uh, the escape room. So I wanted to, to provide some other things that we're working on also in the center. So, uh, next slide. So one of the things that we do is we collect a lot of social media data. We look at the, the structure of these networks online and how that affects the way that ideas spread and how they get amplified. Um, and in doing that kind of data, we can ask different questions that we couldn't if we didn't have this kind of data. It is interesting also that it looks like a duck. Uh, and I do put this in there just because it looks like a duck. We can start to ask questions 
uh, like what would happen or, or what happens when accounts are removed? What affects what, what happens to those communities? Do they continue to, to key, continue to talk about those things? Is there a new ringleader? This is work that's going on with uh, Kayla Duskin, which is one of our PhD students. So we have a paper right now that we're on uh, next slide ready to, to submit. Actually, I put it high because my moving counts here. So it really looks like a duck now. Um, but we can do a lot of um, theoretical work uh, in addition to a lot of the applied work that Chris had mentioned. And so this is an opportunity for those students that are data science students that want to really get into the thick of the data and try to understand how you do discontinuity analysis, how you do um, clustering, how you do um, the kind of statistical procedures that we employ to try to answer some of those questions that we ask. Next slide. More generally, we have recently had a paper, Emma and others are on this as well. This was a big effort of data collection and also developing these generative models that are actually inspired by epidemiologists. So we can use what are called contagion models to try to simulate essentially worlds um, that really don't exist, uh, or they're, they're just sort of simulating the computer to try to understand the effects of different interventions that are being um, proposed and deployed online right now. And if we were at Twitter or Facebook, well, you wouldn't want to be at Twitter right now. So you probably have the pink slip. But uh, if you were at places like that, you um, you could run experiments, and they're probably running experiments experiments all the time. But in the research world, we have a set of ethics, and we can't run these experiments. And I hope they are being cautious. So this is a way doing this kind of more simulation work, we can try to understand how different interventions work in this case, and I'm happy to jump into uh, more detail into these kinds of things as well. But I want to sort of look at the entire continuum of things we're doing, so from sort of uh, real computational, uh, simulative uh, data science work to, uh, next slide, to really thinking about how we solve this problem with the communities that we work on it. And uh, the PIs, we wrote a paper on how do you solve a problem like misinformation. Turns out it's really hard, but we talk about three distinctions. Next slide. And one of the main distinctions that's been helping me think a lot about how I address the education side is to think about the two different groups that really exist out there when we're working with the public around this issue of misinformation. There's the group that's mistaken belief that actually if you give them good information, they may actually uh, potentially change their opinion. But then there's the group that's the conviction group. And that's a whole different approach to dealing with this issue of misinformation. And that's why we have other projects like Chris has mentioned. Next slide. And the slide, uh, and the work we do with Misinfo Day, which is a big program that we do with high schools around the state of Washington, and actually in the United States, and outside the United States. Next slide. Oh, and there was one other slide that was actually going to lead to Jason Young's stuff that he's going to talk about later, where we actually work with the communities to co-participate and design interventions. And I have one more second. Okay, actually, Nate. Yeah, All right, uh, next person. <laughs> It's me. Yes. I've been sandwiched in between all the misinformation stuff because I too am working with Jason and it's a really fun project. I'm Cindy Aiden. I'm so sorry that my colleague Sandy Littletree cannot be here. She's still down in Olympia today. So I'm standing in for both of us. And I'm the professor of practice at the University of Washington High School. Next slide, please. So we are working on a project with the Mellon Foundation. One of the reasons I wanted to be sure to stand up here is to tell you that there are these interesting granting organizations, and we professors can get sometimes smaller grants, less flashy than an NSF grant, but nonetheless an interesting project. The interesting thing about Mellon Foundation, if you're in the grant world, is that they give grants oftentimes throughout the year, whereas some granting organizations have deadlines and big, like, IMLS, another big granting organization, only gives them in September, unless you ask especially nicely. So we um, had some flexibility, and we are working on tribal libraries in the state of Washington. We are visiting them, and we are using indigenous ways of engaging our community to really learn something more about the state of tribal libraries, their hopes and dreams, how if you wanted to support tribal libraries in doing something new, how would you effectively do that? How would you as a granting organization like the Mellon Foundation effectively engage with tribal libraries and understand what they're doing? The opportunity for uh, directed fieldwork students, independent study, or perhaps we're looking into an actual paid position to have someone support us for um, on an hourly basis next quarter is to visit libraries to help us with note transcription. By the way, we're not recording at the request of our subjects, so it's really nice to have more than one student in the room to help us take the notes and talk afterwards about what we heard. 
um, analyzing those conversations, identifying trends, and then um, in spring quarter, we're going to be trying to synthesize what we've learned. Next slide, please. And because I wanted to give you a little learning moment in all of this, um, classic research has involved studying subjects. You know, I'm a librarian from way back, and it used to be that there was this incredible file called her Wrath. Does that name ring a bell to anybody in this room? I didn't think so. Human Relations Area Files. That's an incredible collection of microfiche, of all things, of anthropologists for the last hundred years that have stu studied all kinds of different communities around the world. That kind of research was much more of the classic kind. You would arrive, you would try not to disturb and influence how the community was operating, and you would study it. You would bring information back, you'd collect things, and you'd try and be a more of an observer and try to avoid influencing behavior. Indigenous research is participatory research. We are trying to build a relationship to gain trust, to gain more insights. We are using reciprocity. We want to be in a position to do a favor if it's important, to try again to build that trust, to share information, not just sit back and wait for them to tell us things, Respect, of course, these are sovereign governments that we're working with, so you must be very aware of protocol and understand how to approach. Um, and then, as I said, possibly not recording, photographing, taking anything out of the interaction, and giving back to the community as much as you are taking. Next slide, please. People who participate will learn about tribal libraries in Washington and the various ways that tribes work and their priorities, the procedures for visiting, meeting with tribal library staff and community members, understanding some of these fine points that I just told you about, the requirements, the procedures, also how to do research with live human subjects at the University of Washington. There's a lot of protocol about that too. And then there is some background work that our, that our DFWs are doing this quarter, and um, understanding some role of being a faculty member leading a grant, you're gonna see up close and personal what it's like to be a researcher because I too want to see half this room become researchers in ILS research and uh, forward all the great things that can happen with library science inside an R1 institution. Next slide, please. That's it. I'm sorry you can't meet Sandy, but please contact us if you have any uh, questions about this. Thanks a lot. I'm Chris Oasis. I'm a senior research scientist here at the iSchool. Okay. Lots of things to move around. Uh, so I'm going to talk briefly about some of my research involving open data. Um, it's both about public libraries and also explorations um, into open data for public libraries. So real quickly, this is a snapshot of just the continental United States. Um, I had to leave out Alaska and Hawaii, but this is a snapshot of 17,000 public libraries across the United States. So really, sort of a layer of social infrastructure across the United States. So I've worked with public libraries for a long time. And I've always been interested in um, how they use or don't use data um, that they collect or have available for use. So I became a lot more familiar with the variety of data that's collected about libraries um, when I worked at the state library agency um, during one part of my career. So a lot of effort goes into collecting data about libraries. Um, from the data that's collected about them, uh, I use that to answer questions primarily about internet and technology infrastructure that exists in those libraries. So one example, uh, I'm working to understand the types, speeds, and costs of internet connections um, at approximately 11,000 public libraries that participate in a federal program that's called E-Rate. So this program provides about $2.5 billion a year in funding to both schools and libraries, and so I'm trying to understand um, what benefits libraries get from that program and also um, the differences between, say, urban and rural libraries and who benefits more. Um, so uh, through that uh, work with the open data, um, I also started to think about how open data could be a benefit to public libraries 
in understanding uh, their communities. And so uh, we've started research into this, um, especially around interviewing public library staff to understand how they use open data to help develop programs and services in their communities. All right, well, I'll shout. So, uh, so right now, the next phase of our, of our work is basically doing interviews with public library staff to understand how they utilize open data um, and the challenges and barriers associated with that so that they can understand their communities better. Um, so if any of this sounds interesting to you, um, in the past, uh, I've worked with students on independent studies, and um, that's the current uh, opportunities that are available. Um, in the past, when they've worked on the data, uh, they've looked at exploring and uh, developing uh, the data sets, including cleaning and filtering and analysis to answer questions. Um, and in the future, there's also going to be opportunities to assist with the qualitative analysis of the interviews um, that will eventually lead to uh, development of a platform for open data for public libraries. Okay, uh, I am Stacey Winlick, and go ahead next slide. And I'm a research scientist uh, here at the iSchool with the uh, Technology and Social Change Group, or TASHA. And I'm here uh, representing a uh, core institution uh, research uh, team. I'm going to tell you about a very new initiative that we're getting started. So uh, this map that you see up here on the screen is um, was created by journalists at uh, the Markup. And it shows the internet service provider uh, CenturyLink's uh, availability across the, the city of Seattle. And those red dots mean that those addresses, uh, CenturyLink does not offer a, those addresses uh, high-speed broadband. It does not meet the threshold. Uh, and um, what their analysis found in that 22 cities across the United States that the that there were slower speeds and higher costs in lower income and least white neighborhoods. And that often in the lowest income and least white neighborhoods, they were paying more per megabit of download as compared to uh, wealthier and wider neighborhoods. Uh, next slide. And so this is um, the findings from the markup and other findings from activists and academics um, really point to a active structural issues that exclude and marginalize communities of color accessing digital technologies in the United States. And um, this rich, um, there is a concept called digital redlining that has its origins in um, historical redlining, which was a practice the United States government did in the, started in the 30s, which would actually draw physical red lines around neighborhoods that they deemed undesirable which were often neighborhoods that were populated by black, indigenous, and communities of color. And so digital redlining extends this concept um, into digital technologies, and it is how internet service providers discriminate against black, indigenous, and people of color through the deployment, maintenance, delivery, and cost of internet services, and how policy enables that discrimination. And so um, our team is going to be using uh, critical race spatial analysis which is grounded in critical race theory, um, which accounts for the role of race, racism, and white supremacy in examining geographic and social spaces. Next. Um, and so our current objective is to explore how digital redlining manifests in three Washington cities that have historical redlining maps, which are Seattle, Tacoma, and Spokane. And we're going to be using um, GIS mapping and critical race spatial analysis to um, see how um, digital redlining um, is connected to historical redlining and what other uh, inequalities um, emerge. So our current opportunities for students um, right now is um, independent study for the upcoming, upcoming quarter, if anyone's interested. And in the future, we're hoping to um, offer um, paid opportunities. Um, those can potentially a quantitative, qualitative data collection analysis, uh, building geodatabases, and digital map making. And, um, but those 
Uh, opportunities could also extend for other types of engagement, such as independent studies. So if you're interested in any of this, please contact me. Uh, my email address is on the slide. And thank you very much. So uh, Chris and I are going to stay up here uh, because, uh, go ahead, we are um, uh, pr uh, representing uh, co-designing for trust on behalf of Jason Young, who is happens to be uh, teaching at the moment. Uh, next slide. Um, so um, co-designing for trust is a collaboration between the University of Washington, the University of Texas Austin, Seattle Central College, and the Black, Black Billions Research Project, and uh, dozens of uh, community partners. And Recently, the National Science Foundation funded our team to develop educational approaches to help communities build resilience against the impact of false and misleading information, often referred to as misinformation. And so our project uh, focuses on overcoming inadequacies and how existing digital literacy approaches have been developed to address misinformation. So first, um, we believe it's critical for digital literacy um, and it, to teach individual skills to address the ways that misinformation exploits emotions and social divisions in addition to fact checking and critical thinking skills. And second, we believe that existing digital literacy approaches are often not appropriately tailored to many of the communities that are being disproportionately targeted by misinformation. This is due in part because these communities often do not have a seat at the table when these educational approaches are designed. So in response to these gaps, we are using a participatory design approach to work with communities to reimagine uh, how we teach digital, digital literacy to address misinformation. Our project is focused on collaborations with black and rural communities, and we are very lucky to have some incredible community-based partners ranging from libraries and schools to community-based research organizations. So uh, this is obviously a very big project, and it's being carried out by an interdisciplinary team. Um, as a result, we expect there to be a lot of uh, different, diverse opportunities for student engagement. Um, different parts of the project are engaging in activities including community-based research, curriculum development, technology platform development, educational evaluation, and more. Um, so you can get more detailed information from the site, um, the URLs up there. Um, we're still developing our processes for incorporating students because we're in the startup phase um, into the project. So for now, we're developing a list of students that are potentially interested in opportunities. If you're interested in having your name added to that list, um, please reach out to our project manager, Zoe Burmet. Um, her contact information is there. Uh, please provide her with information about your background and interests, and we'll get back to you about opportunities as they arise. Uh, as mentioned, if you go to this website, there's some fun video up there of the whole team and uh, talking about the projects. So it's pretty nice. Hi, everyone. I'm Melanie Walsh, and I'm an assistant teaching professor in the iSchool here at UW. Um, and I just wanted to talk today about two different projects that I'm working on that students might want to get involved with if you're interested. Um, go to the next slide. So the first is a book project that I'm working on about data as culture or data as a window into culture and how cultural materials like books and songs and works of art uh, are used by people in the world and spread in the world and on the internet. So we've heard a lot of projects looking at how misinformation spreads. I'm interested in how culture spreads and culture can also be part of misinformation campaigns. Um, so in the past it was really hard to know kind of what readers, for example, felt or thought about books. So data offers a lot of new opportunities in this space. There are now 120 million book reviews that have been posted on Goodreads. And there are lots of other examples of social media data that you know, record different traces of people's engagement with culture. So, oh sorry, can you go back one more? Um, so in my book, I'm specifically looking at several famous authors and literary works. Um, and bits of language that have been used by communities and different political movements, such as the Black Lives Matter movement, um, to sort of foster and sustain those movements. So for example, I look at um, how Black Lives Matter tweets, people tweeting about the Black Lives Matter movement, quoted and called upon the novelist and civil rights activist James Baldwin, as you see in this quotation here. 
um, and how they used him to grieve and support the movement or critique the movement. Um, so this is actually one of the chapters that I'm working on expanding right now. Um, so if you're interested in social media data and you're interested in culture, this might be some place where you might want to get involved. Um, next slide, please. I'm also working on a project um, about public library data and data-driven diversity audit, audits. So I've done a lot of work with circulation data made available by the Seattle Public Library. And I've recently learned that corporate library vendors like Ingram and Overdrive and Baker and Taylor, these are companies that sell books to public libraries, are now offering as paid services um, diversity audits. So this is these are companies, these are tools that are supposed to be telling libraries how, how diverse is your collection? This percentage of your books are diverse. So I'm interested in, in doing basically an audit of these audits. So what counts as a diverse book? That's a very difficult question. We know that quantifying race or quantifying diversity is very challenging. So how are these people actually measuring these things? What kind of machine learning approaches are they using? Um, so I'm interested in doing basically a survey of what libraries are using these services um, what alternatives might exist? The St. Louis Public Library, for example, is now doing in-house uh, data-driven diversity audits. So I'm interested in doing sort of a qualitative survey of, of these services and what libraries are using, as well as a kind of algorithmic audit of these audits. So if you're interested in qualitative approaches or quantitative approaches um, and you're interested in diversity in libraries, this might also be something you might want to get involved with. Um, next slide, please. So if you want to get involved right now, some current opportunities that exist include doing an independent study with me. Um, there might also be future opportunities. We don't know if this has been approved yet, but there's a new initiative in the works called the Humanities Data Science Summer Institute. And there might be funding for undergraduate students and, and graduate students to work as RAs on this project. So thank you very much. Carol, I'm going to save you some effort here. You can just advance one, and that's all I've got. <laughs> Howdy, welcome. Hi, I'm Nick Weber. I'm an assistant professor here in the Information School, and I admire my colleagues for their boldness in providing their email addresses. I'm not going to do that. You can click that link, and we have a whole intake form if you want to get involved in research for my group. So, um, who here has heard of a legal clinic? Raise your hands. All right, what about a medical clinic? Okay, uh, what about a technology clinic? Not so many, right? Lots of these. Okay, so the premise of a clinic, right, is that it's supposed to work in a very particular local context, serving a particular community that has needs that are not met by existing legal or medical services. A public interest technology clinic, what I, which I run, has the same mission, but what we're interested in is helping solve problems that are, community, that are faced by community-based organizations, around things like surveillance. We wave our hands at the really hard problems like misinformation, but right, we're very much concerned about public policy and doing applied research that can inform that public policy. So a couple of the projects that we're working on right now have to do with labor policy. Who here uh, voted yesterday? All right, well, you all rejected House Bill 2076, which was partially informed by our work looking at how gig workers over the last three years have experienced pandemic conditions, making deliveries, getting paid time off, putting themselves in uh, health situations which were jeopardizing their family and their long-term ability to raise money. So we have been working with a local union which is representing these drivers, doing interviews, doing quantitative analysis of survey and intake forms that are filled out by gig drivers when they're deactivated from platforms. We are looking for lots and lots of diverse skill sets. If you're a developer and you want to build applications that get used by people doing advocacy, if you are a quantitative analyst and you want to try out some of your skills in machine learning on some of the data sets that we have, if you are a qualitative researcher and you want to get experience working on the front lines and reforming public policy by talking with individuals that have been harmed by, say, a regulation imposed or a house bill that you just voted down, get in touch with us. This is exactly the kind of work that we do and that we're interested in helping you understand how to make a transition, not to work for the Twitters and the Facebooks of the world, but for working with the local governments and the state agencies of the world. 
So you can click here, you can see our intake form, and get involved in any of our work. We have paid opportunities, we have capstone opportunities, and we also have independent research which you can organize with the or one of the lovely PhD students. Thanks. You can move the slide forward, uh, Carol. Hi, I'm Dave Hendry. Um, I'm an ethnicity professor in the Information School, and I'm a co-director of the Value Sensitive Design Lab. For some uh, months, and maybe it's a year or two now, I've been thinking quite hard about this concept uh, of resilience thinking. And this word resilience is popping up all over the place right now. And uh, here's a definition from the Inter Inter Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. And you'll notice in this definition, um, they're balancing a, a, a number of different ideas. One idea is the idea that a system can respond to a shock and not change. And you might think that that is always good, but um, clearly that's not the case. There are many kinds of systems in the world that we want to actually transform. So one of the um, big ideas here, big questions for me, is how indeed is this concept of resilience thinking being used within communities and within uh, 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 local communities, as well as broader communities and networks in order to respond to the climate predicament? One definition of resilience is simply the idea that a branch will bend in a windstorm but not, not break, will return. And there's a number of different metaphors that are involved in this. Stacy um, uh, was a perfect illustration of the concept of how resilience thinking is just moving and circulating through our culture. I believe she said a uh, really provocative research question was, how do we help communities build resilience against misinformation? So one uh, specific project that I did with um, my colleagues and, and brilliant, brilliant students from the Information School, from the School of Law, in the Department of Communications um, with Ryan Callow from the School of Law, and I Friedman, um, our colleague here at the iSchool. We asked a question of a community on the east side of Washington, how did stakeholders in the valley, in our community, uh, respond to stressors from COVID-19 through values, human relationships, and tools, technology, infrastructure? And we were um, interested in uh, how, in fact, do values come into the process of thinking about resilience and design for resilience? And we've been building uh, tools and methods to help communities with um, these kinds of questions. We found in this particular study that uh, a sense of place, that a civic way, that tools and technology shape correctly, and a particular kind of relationship to the land was very important. Um, tapping into some of the uh, some of the ideas that Cindy um, was referring to with in, uh, indigenous thought. So our next project is um, uh, truly around helping um, to empower communities to advocate for their own interest through uh, adaptation and resilience to the climate. Movement. And I'm partnering with uh, Aurora Martin and Esther Min at a a uh, nonprofit organization called Front and Center. Front and Center is a coalition of about a hundred organizations around Washington State. Uh, organizations that are um, uh, members of the community of uh, color. And um, I'm working with this nonprofit to bring in some uh, intentionality around value sets and design and to share practices around how to work with communities and to support possibilities for resilience and for advocating with state agencies around resilience. And with that, I will just stop. in the information school. Uh, I'm going to talk to you a bit about uh, my research on machine learning fairness in hiring. Um, and I do quite a few different uh, disparate topics, so um, I, I, um, 
uh, I, I focus mostly on machine learning fairness in the last couple of years, but I've also applied measuring visual processing to determine firm strategy. So I oftentimes work with these large data sets of uh, tens of millions of documents, and I'm trying to determine what does the industry want? What, do they, what is the strategy for a particular industry? Um, and I apply econometric analysis uh, to improve innovation policy at the U.S. government level. So I work closely with the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office, and uh, we just recently got the largest randomized control trial on uh, independent entrepreneurs at the government level. Um, so entrepreneurship policy is one of the things I do, and machine learning fairness is, is the other. Um, on entrepreneurship policy, we try to test uh, to see if policy is actually doing what it's supposed to be doing. Um, so, for example, this policy was supposed to encourage uh, startups. Uh, we found out that it actually was used primarily by Google to crush their competition. Uh, so that was a fun, that was a fun uh, counterintuitive result. Um, um, and the work I'm talking about today was primarily done uh, uh, with my colleagues at MIT. Uh, it was the uh, grant on fairness, bias, and proper use of machine learning. Uh, several papers and projects came out of this. Uh, the one I'm presenting today is uh, still open-ended, and I welcome collaborations. Um, so one thing that really uh, keeps me up at night is uh, what happens to all this data that we volunteer to companies, right? And is it actually, do we have an ability to audit it, and do we know if the algorithms are actually running on the back end and things like credit lending, employment, housing, are they actually fair? And do you consent to actually have those algorithms used on you, on all your information, when you click and fill in the form? Um, so I was able to partner with, uh, uh, with a company uh, with a company ca uh, called Aspiring Minds, which is one of the largest automated interview assessment companies in the world. They run tens of millions of tests uh, and, and assessments uh, to determine whether or not you deserve a particular type of job or not. Um, and what, what I looked at here is uh, we, we impose the experimental setup to determine if there are issues in the training data that end, end up being, uh, uh, end up being uh, learned by the algorithm, for example, individual biases or preferences that the graders and trainers that might have. And was, this was a, uh, a very first time of this kind of study. Um, and we looked at things uh, that, that are obvious, like uh, authoritarian tendencies and uh, nationalism and whatnot. And this, but we also looked at things that would be uh, unknown subjective biases that you might not necessarily know that you have. Right? They, come, they might come from culture or, or uh, other preferences. And we ran very extensive stud studies on the graders before they actually were allowed to touch the training data. Um, and the data looks like this. These are actual interviews of candidates. And then we had them grade the interviews uh, in a randomized, uh, in a randomized uh, study. And we found out that machine learning, if it does know about uh, the biases, can actually reverse them. So if you use uh, the biases as variables in, in training your model, you can actually reverse the biases of the individuals in the final result. Um, and um, what I'm looking at right now is trying to better understand what ground truth is in context of hiring. In, uh, especially for machine learning tools, uh, and I'm looking at integrating more personality tests in uh, in, uh, in in in, in uh, evaluating training sets, uh, and working on getting buy-in from other industry partners in other areas than just hiring. Uh, so I'm looking for undergraduates uh, and uh, graduate students who are interested in independent studies uh, or hourly uh, paid area opportunities. Thank you. Hi, I'm Michelle Martin. I'm the Beverly Cleary Professor for Children and Youth Services and the Master Library and Information Science Chair. Um, one of the projects that I'm working on is Project Voice, which is value-sensitive design of outcomes informing community engagement. And we basically, it's a three-year that I think is extended to four years now, project that is helping, um, developing a toolkit, well really has already developed a toolkit, to help librarians um, plan outreach with, not for their communities, with participatory design and with a social justice lens. We are now working with uh, Web, Web Junction to turn that toolkit into a course that librarians can walk through either individually or with their systems to better serve their communities and really center community. Um, we're not currently looking for students, but opportunities could come up next. And then I, I'm also um, I have a nonprofit called Readorama that uses children's books as the springboard for all the activities. Um, we've had a number of summers of camp and are planning um, programming throughout the spring. Um, we have had independent study students, we've had DFWs, we've had three capstones, one of which designed a um, trauma-informed care training that we put the Camp Readorama staff through. And we also run several weeks of camp 
in the summertime for Compass Housing Alliance, which is affordable housing for families that have previously experienced homelessness. So we are in the process of scaling up Read-A-Rama, uh, chatting with the Brooklyn Public Library, which has 61 branches pretty soon, to uh, see about spreading Camp Read-A-Rama there. So um, some exciting things. And there are lots of opportunities to get involved with Read-A-Rama. Next. And then um, I am, my PhD is in English. I still have my humanities side that is alive and well. Um, so well, this event over here was an event that we ran at REI that was called Hiking Husky Storytime, which was really fun. Um, but I uh, have a strand of research that comes out of my Girl Scout background, um, which is about picture books and the lack of diversity and representations of black and brown kids outdoors, having immersive outdoor experiences. Um, the Spencer Shaw lecture, which happened a few weeks ago, a Native American um, writer who's been at it for about 50 years, um, Joseph Bruchak, did the lecture, but the person who, for whom it's named, um, there's not a lot written about Spencer Shaw. So uh, in the spring, I'm going to winter and spring, I'll start interviews with folks who had him as an instructor. He was an African American professor and taught storytelling, and lots of people got trained in their method of storytelling um, from him. So we'll be working on that, and then um, I have applied for a Fulbright scholarship to uh, New Zealand and hope to take a bunch of students on study abroad next year. We've just put in the proposal like two days ago, but the study abroad I think will sort of uh, pave the way for some research to happen uh, in uh, Aotearoa, New Zealand. But the name of that one, which should be open in mid-December, is iSchool Aotearoa. Do check out the study abroad opportunities because there are myriad for this year. And then uh, next April, we had the first Native American read-in. Uh, this April, next April, we'll have another one. And my students just voted in my class um, about for about five artists to invite. So I'll be in the, I've just hired somebody to project manage that. And um, if anybody wants to get involved with that, I'd be happy to, uh, to have help with that. Thank you. Hi everyone, I don't have slides, so I hope this will save a few seconds. I'm Eileen Kaliskan. I'm an assistant professor. I'm also a fellow at the Brookings Institution in Governance Studies because our research directly informs information technology policy. I study artificial intelligence, ethics, and bias through implicit machine cognition, focusing on primarily natural language processing as well as machine learning, computer vision, and nowadays, speech processing. And I'm always looking for collaborators and students to work on research, volunteer researchers, participants for credit in my directed research group, as well as research assistants. So I'll give you a brief overview of my research. And I'll start with asking you a few questions. For example, given some choices, such as rose and lilies versus mosquitoes and cockroach. Are flowers or insects more positive and pleasant? Flowers, yes. What about musical instruments versus weapons and machine guns? Musical instruments, yes. Machines perceive the world in a similar way. They find flowers, love, laughter, pleasant, machine guns, mosquitoes, unpleasant. What happens when machines perceive social groups in particular ways? For example, white Americans versus European Americans, homosexual versus heterosexual individuals, or able versus disabled, young and old people. What about men versus women? Are women better fits for science and career? In our recent work, we have shown that machines learn human-like biases. Essentially, the way society is biased, systemic injustices get transferred to machines. As machines, artificial intelligence systems are large-scale, socio-technical information processing systems. And this has significant implications for consequential decision-making tasks and society, as AI is co-evolving with society. For example, Machines are today making consequential decisions about who is going to get a loan. Are you going to advance to the next round in a job candidate assessment process? Uh, what about college admissions or smart city planning? All the data you are exposed to on the internet, your social media feeds, 
machine translation, voice assistants, all of these are automated through machine learning applications that perceive the world in a biased way due to the way they learn systemic injustices. And essentially today, machines are perpetuating and amplifying bias at an unprecedented scale. And accordingly, we would like to understand the implications for individuals that are exposed to the information generated by machines. What about humans in the loop that are collaborating with machines to decide if you are going to get an uh, organ transplant? Or how are these machines shaped in society at scale? And at an unprecedented scale in an accelerated manner right now. So essentially, we are trying to understand the long-term implications of how machines are co-evolving with society as information is being transferred from human society to artificial intelligence systems. I look forward to working with all of you on these problems. Okay, just to close up on the lightning talks, we will then move to questions. So be thinking about who you'd like to ask for more information on their research. Um, I thought I'd share one project I'm involved in and helping to lead right now. It's called Data Services for Indigenous Scholarship and Sovereignty. And our tagline for this is, because that's a long, complicated title, um, our tagline is Stewarding Indigenous Research Data with Care. And CARE is a particular set of new principles that have come out of an international collaboration of various groups who are interested in um, indigenous data sovereignty. So I first wanted to share with you um, the really powerful collaboration that we've put together in order to examine this. We have a group here at the Information School. I'm just sort of the ringleader, um, and I'm working along with uh, Miranda Ballarde lewis Sandy Little-Tree, who you've already heard about, Nick Weber, who you've already um, seen, um, and Caitlin Schrader, who's our RA, and Isaksa Chabrain, who is another PhD student RA. But the really exciting part is that we have all these great partners who are helping us understand these care principles and how we can put them into practice. So we're working with indigenous scholars in the American Indian Studies Department here at the university. Uh, one of those is also um, the curator of Northwest Native American Art at the Burke Museum. Uh, we have our data services specialists from UW Libraries um, involved, and then two really important um, partners. One is the University of British Columbia, where the Weewa Library um, is our core partner, and it's one of the few libraries, um, well, there's several in Canada, few and almost zero in our country, uh, really designed to work with indigenous scholars. And they've been involved in a lot of indigenous uh, data, di digitization projects for indigenous collections, and now are starting to learn about uh, research data. Our other big collaborator is um, the Qualitative Data Repository, and that's based at Syracuse University. And Nick has been a long-standing technical director there, and they are helping us try to understand how we technically can build the platform for protecting and sharing, when um, necessary, um, indigenous data. And then we have another specialist at the Washington State University Center for Digital Scholarship and, and uh, Curation, who does a lot on metadata and um, uh, cultural heritage uh, collections online for indigenous communities. So basically what we want to come up with um, through this process is to build up a set of guiding protocols for libraries and repositories for actually implementing these care principles because the principles have been out for a few years but really libraries and repositories don't have a good sense of what it means to put them into practice in their organizations. They've gone pretty far with this other set of principles. Have any of you heard of the FAIR principles? A few. Yeah, not many. Well, they're They've been um, embraced by repositories, libraries, scientists, researchers all over um, to try to make research more open. And so those principles are about making data findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. The care principles, on the other hand, are a little bit in conflict with this sort of guiding practice that's pushing libraries and repositories right now. And they are uh, devoted to the idea of collective benefit for indigenous communities, authority to control the data that's produced about their communities, 
responsibility, ethics, etc. So we we're going to be looking into building up policies, protocols, practical strategies for guaranteeing the protections needed. We've already sort of gotten through the first phase where we're working with the indigenous scholars themselves to understand their practices and needs. And phase two will be really building up professional awareness for librarians and information professionals and building a prototype in QDR. So, and we're also working on metadata approaches. Um, so I put down at the bottom sort of the most likely thing for students going forward. That would be potential for capstones next academic year when we're moving into the prototype and education phases. So you can be in touch with me or any of the other PIs. Okay. That is what time it is. This is exactly where we were supposed to be. I can't believe that the group four minutes. That is amazing. Well, thank you for doing that. So thank you. I also we will move into questions or you can stay and just identify the people you'd like to talk to. But I do want to thank Mallory Shaw, Kathy Mitchell, and all the people who participated in putting this event together um, for what, you know, is part of that I Welcome Week, which has now turned into I Welcome Months. Uh, but I hope you do feel welcome, and especially to uh, finding your way into research projects. So I will open up the floor for questions from any of the students who are here. Um, and we'll do that for a few minutes, but then you're welcome to um, sort of mingle with the folks that are here. Follow-ups with anyone? Yes? I'm not a student, but um, I'm an academic advisor for the MLIS program, but I uh, work with a lot of online students, and I just uh, want to ask um, how online students can get involved um, or just kind of speak a little bit to online. That's a great uh, great question. Um, I know for us, Capstone students can be online, um, and many of the things we're involved in can be online. And of course, many of us have been running our research projects online for years now, having to make that turn. So I do think um, that's um, you know really much more open than it maybe it was years ago. But can we see a, maybe a raise of hands of the researchers who uh, would welcome online students into their projects? So, more than half, I would say. Thank you. Yes, great question. Thank you for raising that. Are you head spinning? Lots, lots of research? Thank you. Good. Here's a question. Instead of doing this, can we have like a a like a one-on-one -on -one panel like for the presenters? Have a one-on-one -on -one panel. Like for example, if they all line up and then like we go up to them and then line, would that be more viable? Right now. I like that idea. Is that because because I if we do like a career fair kind of format, would that be more? Oh popular? yeah. Well, we certainly could program that for next time. Um, this is we've always just sort of done the blitz, and this is you know, we've done the lightning talks. But I I do like that idea. Um, I think the intention here is to find out what you're interested in, and then if you want to talk further with someone who is here, to seek them out. Um, and most people gave you an email address, but we're all easy to find. Um, we're all in the directory, um, or if you have trouble finding anyone, you can always connect with uh, Mallory Shaw, and she can point you in the right direction. But I like that idea, and there might be some additional programming we can do next time. I think everybody's sort of on a tight schedule and bringing people up right now would be a little challenging. But thank you for that. Other suggestions? This is great. We really can um, do anything you want in coming quarters and uh, years ahead. Well, I have a question. Who would you approach on the panel and what would you ask them? <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Four or five right now. Prioritize. <laughs> okay, well, we, I, I do have one question. Okay. Great. Yeah, so my question is, in terms of independent studies, if, let's say, the student has an idea that is not, for example, already, like, predefined um, doing that, because we understand that, like, faculties, they're, you know, busy out of their lives, I'm and gonna... your, their ability to support independent projects could be differing. I just want to hear the 
Thoughts of I'm going to give this one to Nick because I know he entertains this. Kind of <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I would say that that's the dream, right? Uh, it's fun. You yeah, no. just got to get really close. I, I would say that's the dream. Might come to us with ideas. Pitch us on ideas. That is a very one uh, ambitious thing to do, and that shows that you're going to be a great student to work with. But two, right? We are experts in methods. We're experts in content. But uh, you all have a lot of insight into the communities that you work in the places that you frequent online, and we are inherently curious about that. So I would say don't shy away from doing that, but also be open to getting direction about how to take the independent study and that sort of thing. Any other? Uh, researchers who, oh my gosh. <laughs> uh, any other quick question about yes. this event. Would it be like slides available for like contact info and such? We have recorded it, so we will actually have the recording available, the video available, and we can certainly, we'll post the slides as well. We can do that, of course. Yeah, I appreciate that. Sure. Anything else? We're going to cut you loose then to go finish your day, but think about the research that you'd like to pursue with our faculty and researchers. Thank you. Thank you.